My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power, to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord. Well, how many of you know who Bill Gates is? I think just about everybody know who Bill Gates is. I think he was the, the founder of Microsoft. Well, without a doubt, Bill Gates is one of the wealthiest persons in the United States. As a matter of fact, in Forbes 400, the list of the 400 wealthiest Americans, Bill Gates finds himself at the very top of that list. Now, now catch this, he is worth, they say that his, his, his net worth is $76 billion. That's, that's, that's billion with a B, not million with an M. Let me, let me put $76 billion in perspective and uh, how much this guy actually is making. They say that he makes $115 every second of his life. And so count the five. One, two, three, four, five. Bill Gates just made 500 bucks. I mean, just like that. They, think about this. I mean, imagine you're walking down the street and you find a C-note, a $100 bill on the ground. All right, you and I, if we saw a $100 bill, what would we do? We would, we would stop, we would take two or three seconds and pick it up. Well, if Bill Gates took time to pick up a C-note, he would lose money because it would take about, about three seconds to earn 100 bucks, and he's already earned 300 bucks. $76 billion is a lot of money. Think about this. Bill Gates is now 60 years old. If Bill Gates lives to 90, if he lives another 30 years, he will have to spend $7 million every single day of his life to liquidate his wealth. Think about that, every day having to spend $7 million. Think about that. If Bill Gates decided that he was going to be magnanimous and he was going to give everybody on the planet $10. So today Bill Gates says, you know what, I want to give every person on the planet, there's about 6.8 billion people, 7 billion people on the planet today. If he says, I want to give every person on earth $7 billion dollars, he would start, pardon? Oh, what did I say? Oh, my word, yeah. How many would love to have $7 billion from Bill Gates? You'd love to do that. Okay, let me go back. I just ruined the entire illustration, all right? If he gave every person on the planet $10, all right? Every person, 7 billion plus of us, seven or $10, man, I'm having a hard time saying that, he would still be worth four to $5 billion. I mean, wealth that you and I cannot even begin to imagine. Now, Bill Gates is an extremely generous man. The, they say that he's given away some 26 to 28 billion dollars. He's given that away to various charities, the majority of which he gives to his foundation, which is dedicated to eradicating certain diseases in third world countries. Yes, Bill Gates is an extremely wealthy man, but Bill Gates is an extremely generous man as well. In fact, we would say he is unbelievably generous. Yet, when you compare his generosity with the generosity of God, when you compare Bill Gates's phil um, philanthropy, his, his giving away money, with God's generousness or generosity, Bill Gates looks miserly. 
He looks unbelievably tight-fisted. He's a hoarder, clinging to uh, his wealth. You see, here's my point today. I want you to catch this. There is no one who is as magnanimously generous. There is no one who freely gives. There is no one who is always looking for the benefit of others as our great God. Today we want to study the simple fact that God is generous. Would you say that with me today? God is generous. Say it one more time. God is generous. That truth is seen in the psalm that we're studying during the month of November. And so once again, open your Bibles, turn on your phones, your, your iPad, your device, to Psalm 145. And today we're going to read verses 10 through 16. Psalm 145, beginning in verse 10, David says this, All your works, we'll explain what that means, all your works shall give thanks to you, O God, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And your dominion endures throughout all generations. Depending upon your translation, you might have the next phrase. The Lord is faithful in all his works and kind, or in all his words and kind in all of his works. I'll just explain. Remember I told you at the very beginning that this psalm was an acrostic psalm and, and all the letters of the Hebrew alphabet are found except for the Hebrew letter none. And many believe that there's a missing verse in this and they have tried to include what they think the missing verse is. That's the only reason you'll find it in parentheses. Verse 14, the Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down the eyes of all, the eyes of all the earth look to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand and you satisfy the desire of every living thing. Would you pray with me today? Oh, Holy Spirit of God, we pray today that you would be the great teacher. Lord, Lord, help us to not only comprehend the words and the verbiage of of this psalm, these verses. But I pray that you'd help us to walk away grasping, completely understanding, comprehending the truth that you are an unbelievably generous God. Lord, today we confess our lack of appreciation. Lord, today we, we confess our, our ungratitude, our, our lack of being thankful for that which you give us. And today we recognize you. We give thanks for the fact that you are an extremely generous God. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This week we celebrate Thanksgiving. Are you excited about Thanksgiving? How many of you have family that are coming in? You have family that are coming in for Thanksgiving? Well, not that many. How many of you are, how many are thankful that you don't have family that are coming in? I don't know. <laughs> Boy, I kind of looked at you and you were like, man, I don't want any family that's coming in. <laughs> that was kind of weird. Uh, how many are leaving and going out of town for Thanksgiving? All right, a few of you, all right. How many of you are looking forward to eating? All right, of course we are. I always like to celebrate Thanksgiving with four words, all right? Um, family, food, football, and then I like to keep it alliterated, flop. You say, Brian, what does that mean? Well, family arrives, we eat, we turn on the football game, and then I flop on the couch, all right? And then at about, you know, what the, depending on the time we eat, two or three hours later, I do it all over again. Wake up, family's still there, eat food, watch another football game, and flop on the couch. That's what Thanksgiving is to us. I don't know how spiritual that sounds, but that is, that is Thanksgiving at the Burkholder household. Well, as we've studied this much, or, or this month, there's so much for which you and I should be thankful. Our, our theme, very simply this month, is give 
thanks. And we're studying Psalm 145, which is a psalm in its entirety that's dedicated to the importance of thanking and praising God. In our first message, we saw the first seven verses, and we saw the fact that that He is worthy of our thanks. He is worthy of our praise because He alone is worthy. Last week, we saw that He is good. He is gracious. His goodness is demonstrated in our lives, and and his graciousness, his grace is demonstrated in our lives. Think about this for just a second. Where would you and I be today were it not for the grace of God? I mean, where would we be today were it not for God's mercies that are new every single morning in our life? He's good, is he not? God is good. You You remembered, and all the time, God is good. Today we study the fact that God is generous. Now, as I look out over our congregation today, there's a lot of people, I know the majority of you, I don't know all of you, but even if I know you, I do not know the specifics of your life. Today I have no idea how much money you have in your bank accounts. I don't know how much you owe on your mortgage, whether your house is paid for or, or whether you got you know, another 70 years to pay for your house. I don't know what your health situation, at least all of you, and I don't even know the specific situation of your home. There is one thing I do know, though, about each and every one of us, and that is this simple truth. God has been extremely generous to you. And God has been extremely generous to me. And I am afraid, and we'll see it today, I am afraid that at times we are so ungrateful for all the blessings that God gives to us. And so today in these seven verses, I just want to answer two simple questions. The first question is answered in verse 10. The second question is answered in verses 11 through 16. The first question is this, who should give thanks And the second question is this, for what should we give thanks? And so once again, the first question, who should give thanks? Notice verse 10 with me once again. Here's what David says, all of your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all of your saints shall bless you. The contemporary English version says it this way, all creation will thank you. The Message Bible says creation and creatures applaud you. Here's the point if you're following along in your outline. All of God's creation thanks and praises him. That's what David is saying. All of your works shall give thanks to you, O God. That truth is seen throughout the Psalms. Psalm 19 and verse 1, some of, you, some of you know that by heart. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Psalm 98, verses 7 and 8, let the sea roar, and all that fills it, the world and all those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands, let the hills sing for joy. You see, I'm convinced, along with the words of Jesus, that if you and I were really tuned to God and his nature, his creation, that you and I would hear even the rocks and the hills and the forests crying out that he alone is worthy, that he alone deserves our praise. David says in Psalms 150 and verse 6, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. How many of us here today have breath? All right, I thought so. So what's the idea? All of us should praise the Lord. Now, you may say this morning, and you would be right in saying it, you might sit back today and say, Brian, hold on a second, time out. I know that David says here that all of God's works, all of God's creation, and all of God's creatures will praise him, but what about those people who do not even believe that God exists? What about those people who classify themselves as agnostics or they classify themselves as atheists? I mean, they don't even recognize that God exists. How in the world do they give thanks and praise him? By the way, there's a lot of people in our society that way. 
he, uh, I was reminded of, not that I, I watched the show, but I was reminded of Bart Simpson's prayer. Bart Simpson's Thanksgiving Day prayer. You probably heard this. Bart Simpson prayed, Dear God, we paid for all of this stuff ourselves, so thanks for nothing. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of people who, who live that way. What am I going to give thanks to God for? I, I did this with the, with the work of my hands, with the sweat of my brow. I don't even believe that God exists. What do you mean that I am going to give thanks and praise him? With so many people like that, how can God say in his word that all of his works, all of his creation, and all of his creatures will give thanks and praise him? The very truth is this, that every single person will praise and thank God in one of two ways. Let, let me mention them quickly. I'll put them up on the screen. The first is this. You praise God by your mere existence, or you praise God by your mouth. You see, even those who do not recognize the existence of God, even those who personally claim that they're agnostics or even further that they're atheists and they would deny the very existence of God, the fact that their heart is beating at this moment, the intricacies of the human body, the capacity of their human mind to even be able to think and contemplate the innate desire to love and to care for one another. All of that points to the existence of a divine creator. And whether they want to or not, their mere existence, the fact that the light shines in their room and their eyes open up in the morning and they have another day to live, all of that points to and praises the creator of their lives. So regardless of whether or not a person claims to be an agnostic or a believer, whether they recognize God or reject God, their mere existence cries out in praise to an omnipotent, divine creator. David says this, he said, all of creation will thank and praise you. He makes a second statement at the latter part of verse 10. He says this, all God's saints thank and bless him or praise him. Notice verse 10, all your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord. All your saints shall bless you. Now, now, two interesting things here. The term saints in this verse speaks of God's covenant partners. Let me explain what I mean. The term saints comes from the same root as the term that we studied last week that is translated steadfast love in verse 8. As a matter of fact, if you have your Bibles, go back to verse 8. Go back to verse 8, and remember what David said. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. We saw that was the Hebrew word has said, which means God's covenant love, God's faithful love who he, that he demonstrates even to his unfaithful people. Well, the word saints here is a derivative of that exact same word. Um, has said means God's steadfast covenant love. The word here that it's translated means God's covenant people. God's covenant partners. Here's the idea, and I want you to catch this. You guys are a smart crowd. Just as God has demonstrated such love to us, we in turn reciprocate and by faith commit to be his covenant partners. We commit to be his saints. I trust there was a time in your life when you've done that. We just saw seven people who walked through our baptismal waters today and said, yes, I have trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I am entering in a covenant with God, trusting that my sins are forgiven. I am entrusting my life to him. I am becoming one of God's covenant partners. That's what the word saints mean here. All of your saints shall bless you. The, the word bless is a second word, is a very interesting word. Bless is an expression of thankful praise. I had to kind of think through this just a little bit. Bless literally means to wish God well. Now, now, I mean, that kind of sounds funny. I mean, you know, you go to God who's the creator of everything, you know, the, the omnipotent one, it's like, Hey, God, 
I wish you well. <laughs> God bless you, God. God. I, mean, I mean, it almost sounds just a little funny to say that, doesn't that? God bless you, God. The, 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 the word bless has the idea of wishing well. It literally means to wish God well, to make him, as it were, even more blessed. So, so, so here's what I want you to catch. When you, when you bless the Lord, which we're commanded to do, when you bless the Lord, you praise him by desiring that he becomes even more of what he already is. For example, it's like me looking at Vicky and say, Vicky, be beautiful. She, she's, she's already beautiful. I just want her to be even more of what she already is. It's like looking at Thomas and say, Thomas, be funny, all right? Thomas, uh, Thomas is already, I mean, you just look at him and you giggle sometimes, all right? And you look at him and say, Thomas, just be more funny than you already are. It's like looking at Pastor Brad and saying, Brad, be cool, all right? Br Br Brad is what? I mean, Brad's the epitome of cool. If you look up the word cool in the dictionary, cool pastor, you got a picture of Brad, you know, in his jeans and, and his jacket. Um, during October, our kids uh, uh, celebrate in the school, they, they celebrate Pastor Appreciation Month, and they have a week where they highlight each of, each of the pastors. And I think Brad even has this on his office door. You can go there. One of, the, one of the kids had written, we're so glad that we have a pastor that's cool. All right. They didn't write it about me. They didn't write it about Jose. They didn't write it about Thomas. They wrote it about Brad. Brad's cool. What? Well, I mean, the, the idea is just saying, okay, I want you to be what you already are. And so th that's the idea of the word bless. We, we find that throughout Scripture, Psalm 100 and verse 4. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Psalm 103 and verse 2, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Let me ask you today, are you thankful? Think about that just for a second. Are you I'm not talking about Thanksgiving Day. All of us are thankful on Thanksgiving Day. Are you truly thankful for what God has done, is doing, and will do in your life? Here's a great question that I'll even ask you at the end. Do your actions, do your words, does your life cry out in praise and thanksgiving to God? I'd venture to say many people, maybe not none of us, but many people in practice, they would never echo the words of Bart Simpson, but in practice, they're ungrateful. Here's a warning. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, Paul says, but understand this, in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of their own selves, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive to or disobedient to their parents, ungrateful and unholy. May that word, may that verse not speak prophetically about your life and my life. May we truly be thankful for all that God has done for us. Don't be ungrateful. Today, make a decision that you are going to be a covenant partner that praises his name. There's a second truth, uh, a second question that David answers in our passage. The first is this, who should praise him? And the answer is, all of us should praise him. But the second question is this, for what should we be thankful? And David takes the rest of, of the passage, these 11 verses, after showing us who should praise, David takes it a step further and tells us some things for which we should be thankful. Notice with me the first thing he says this. You and I should praise him. We should be thankful for the greatness of his kingdom. You and I should be thankful. We should praise him for the greatness of his kingdom. Notice verse 11. He says this. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power. Now, now, now catch this. You don't have to spend much time around a person to find out what is important to them. 
As a matter of fact, I can spend five or ten minutes with a, with a person, and for the most part, I can tell you what is important in that person's life. Why is that? Because they're going to talk about it. <laughs> they're going to, in one way or another, they're going to tell me what is important. For example, you spend much time around Pastor Thomas, you're going to know that he's a New York Knicks fan. Isn't that right? I don't understand why. I don't get it. But, but he's, a, he's a New York Knicks fan. We're standing right by the door this morning. Looks at me and says, man, can you believe that poor Singus guy, you know, that new player for the New York Knicks? He loves the Knicks. You don't have to spend a lot of time around him. You know that. You don't have to spend a lot of time around my son, Mark, and you'll realize that He's newly married. He's still got that honeymoon glow all over him. And, and, uh, and he, he stands up at times and says, I told you I just got married in the last 30 days. I mean, he's excited about that. He, he talks about it. Are you kissing her, Mark? Is that what you're doing? You're giving her a kiss. <laughs> you don't have to spend much time around Dr. Mike Hill. You know he's passionate about kingdom education. That he's passionate about reaching boys and girls for Jesus Christ and training them to be citizens of the kingdom. I love his passion. He talks about it. You're around him much. He talks about it. If you're around me, you know that I love my granddaughter, Isabella. I talk about, by the way, have I showed you a picture of her lately? I haven't shown you a picture. There's my granddaughter, Isabella, at Mark and April's wedding. Here's the point. Here's what I want you to catch. The kingdom of God should be a favorite topic of conversation for the Christian. Let me say that again, allow that, allow the Holy Spirit of God to take that and seep that into your mind and in your hearts. The kingdom of God should be a favorite topic of conversation for the believer. It should be so much on our minds and our hearts that we dream about it. We discuss about it or discuss it with others. It should be a conversation of our, of our, or should be a topic of our meal conversations. We should be rehearsing, we should be repeating the principles and the blessings of the kingdom of God to our children on a regular basis. That's what David says. He says in verse 11, they will speak of the glories of your kingdom. That reminds me of the words of Moses in Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 and 7. Moses commanded the Israelites this. He said, and these words that I command you today shall be on your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children. And talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. What does Moses say? As parents, we should be rehearsing over and over and over and over and over again in the hearts and minds of our kids. There is a great God who loves us, who is generous to us, and our desire should be to serve. I find it so very convicting how very little time we spend talking about God's kingdom. Talk about our favorite teams. We talk about our hobbies. We talk about our life, our work. We talk about everything that has to do with this life. Listen, I'm not telling you it's a sin to talk about your favorite teams. I mean, I'm... I'm devastated today. My Ohio State Buckeyes lost yesterday, all right? I'm, I'm, about, I'm about to cry, all right? I get all of that. But listen, how often do you talk about the kingdom of God? How often do you think about the kingdom of God? Is it on your mind? Is it on your heart? Do you live it? Do you breathe it? You see, I'm convinced that for many believers, if God took them home today, they would be disappointed because our roots are so deep in this earth, and we think very little about God's kingdom. Let me define the kingdom for you today. I define the kingdom as this. The kingdom of God refers to the dynamic rule of God over his creation. 
You might call it the sovereign rule of God. You might call it God's dominion over his creation. But the Bible speaks over and over and over again about the kingdom of God. It's one of the major themes of the Bible. The terms kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven occur 24 times in the Gospel of Matthew, 14 times in the Gospel of Mark, 32 times in the Gospel of Luke, twice in the Gospel of John, six times in Acts, eight times in Paul's epistles, and once in Revelation. Over and over again, the Bible talks about the kingdom of God. And by the way, if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you are a citizen of the kingdom. And I'm surprised sometimes we talk a whole lot more about our kingdom here in the United States than we do about our heavenly kingdom where our true home really is. A couple of things that aren't in your notes We're to recognize our need for the kingdom. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. You see, when you realize that you need it is when you obtain it. We're we're to pray for the kingdom. Remember in Jesus' exemplary prayer, he said he taught us to pray this way, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're to seek the kingdom. Matthew 6, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these other things will be added to you. Often as believers, the kingdom of God is an afterthought in our life, and we're thinking about so many other things. Now notice here, going back to Psalm 145, David says several things about God's kingdom. Let me just highlight them quickly. The first is this, The Lord's kingdom is great. We talk about the greatness of his kingdom. The Lord's kingdom is great because of its, let me give you a word, because of its pomp. All right, I'm not making up a word. That's a word, all right? Pomp. The word pomp has the idea of splendor. It has the idea of magnificence. It has the idea of beauty. It has the idea of dignity. Verse 11, David says this, they shall speak of the glory of your kingdom. In verse 12, he talks about the glorious splendor of your kingdom. If you were like many people in the world, many people in the world were were fascinated by by the display of pomp and splendor that was exhibited during the wedding of Prince William and Kate Middleton. Anybody remember that? Anybody watch that? I mean, I mean, it was on. The world watched it, and everybody was amazed at the splendor, the pomp, the, 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 the dignity, the beauty of all of that. Yet I'm here to tell you today that the kingdom of God makes their wedding look like that of a pauper. <laughs> God's, God's kingdom is so much greater, so much more glorious. It has so much more splendor. The Lord's kingdom, secondly, is great because of its power. It's great because of its power. Verse 11, and they shall tell of your power. Think with me of some of the greatest empires in the world. The Persian Empire, the Roman Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the British Empire, which, by the way, controlled one-fourth of the world's population, some 13 million square miles. And, of course, the preeminence of the United States, we can look at all of those kingdoms and say, man, those were extremely powerful kingdoms. Yet none of those kingdoms can even begin to compare with the power and the dominion of the kingdom of God. I'm reminded of the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18. He says, all authority, all power in heaven and earth is given to me. Church, I'm afraid also at times that we fail to realize the mighty power of God that is available to us, who by faith in Jesus Christ have become citizens of the kingdom. Hear the words of Paul in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 20. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might? David says we should talk about the pomp of God's kingdom, the power of God's kingdom. And then he says we should also talk about the perpetuity of God's kingdom. 
Verse 13, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Isaiah 9, 7, of the increase of his government and of his peace, there shall be no end. And on, and on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. Maybe George Frederick Handel said it better than anybody else in his great musical score, The Messiah, when he said this, and he shall reign forever and ever. The glory, the greatness of God's kingdom. Let me show you the second thing, and here's where I'm getting. I know our time is just about up, but we should praise him for the generosity of his kingdom. Not just the greatness of his kingdom, but the generosity of of his kingdom as well. Three things that I mentioned that are found in these verses. The first is this. He generously forgives the fallen and lifts up those who are bowed down. I love verse 14. Let me say it again. His words are better than mine. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. You ever fallen? I'm not talking physically. We've all fallen physically. I've fallen off this platform several times. <laughs> all right? Have you, ever, have you ever had a spiritual fall? Of course you have. You ever had a moral fall? Maybe. You ever fallen into sin and sat back and thought, oh, God, how did I get here? How, how did I get here, Lord? I love this verse the Lord upholds all who have fallen. Vicki tells the story. She stepped out. I don't know whether she was convicted by my preaching or not, but she stepped out. Vicki tells the story when we were in high school. I, I wasn't the most gentlemanly guy. Not in high school, college. I wasn't the most gentlemanly guy. And one time Vicki and I were in college and, and we were walking through the chapel and, and, and the floor was slick and, and, and Vicki fell on the floor in front of a whole bunch of people. And you would think Brian and his gentlemanliness would kindly and softly reach down and pick her up and make sure she's okay. And she tells the story, I don't know if I remember it this way, but she tells the story that I'm saying, Vicki, get up, get up. You're embarrassing me, get up, all right? Aren't you glad God doesn't respond that way? Uh, listen, think about it, church. Aren't you glad that when you sin, God doesn't look down at you with a spirit of disdain and say, would you get up? You know better than that. But in his love, he what? He reaches down. And he picks up the fallen. And he, and he ministers to those who are bowed down. Oh, our great God. Ephesians 2, 4, but God being rich in mercy. I love that. Paul could have described as being rich in so many things. But he described him as being rich in mercy. I'm so grateful that God lavishes his grace, his mercy, and his forgiveness on me. Maybe you're here today and you're in desperate need of God's forgiveness. You, you might be here today and say, oh, Brian, if, if you only knew what I have done. Number one, I don't want to know what you've done, but God knows what you've done. And God in his grace reaches down to pick you up. He's very generous in his forgiveness. There's a second thing. He's generously provides food for all of his creation. If you have teenagers at home, you know how much it takes to feed them. Can I get an amen? I mean, good grief. If you don't have teenagers at home and you have small kids, you are going to know how much it takes to feed them in the days to come. Well, listen to that. I mean, I mean, you know, it's like, I mean, you know, I talk to parents all the time. It's like, you know, kids say, I'm hungry. We just ate 30 minutes ago. What are you talking about? You're hungry. You can't keep the refrigerator full. And you know, man, man, just to have enough food in the refrigerator to feed those teenagers is tough. Could you imagine if you realized that you were God, that God, that you not only had to feed your family 
and everybody in your neighborhood, but you had to have enough food for your family and everybody in your neighborhood and everybody in your city. And then you had to have enough food for everybody in your home, your neighborhood, your city, and everybody in your county. And then you had to have enough food for everybody in your home, your city, your county, and your state. And then you had to provide enough food for everybody in your home, your neighborhood, your city, your county, your state, and your country. And then every day you had to provide food for everybody in your home, your neighborhood, your city, your your county, your state, your country, the entire world. Now you know the challenge. It's not even a challenge for God. Now you know what God does. And God sits back and he generously provides food every day for billions and billions of people. Let me show you one more thing and I'm done. And I want to illustrate it. He generously fulfills desires from his open hand. Notice verse 16, he says this. You open, or you open your hand and you satisfy the desire of every living thing. I did a, a word study on that open hand and here's, here's the analogy, here's the word picture that is taking place. Don't worry, I've already asked our facilities team if I can do this, all right? Ron, I've already asked Mark if I can do this and he said I'm okay, all right? Here's the idea. It's like going into a brood of chickens. Anybody ever fed chickens? All right, two or three of you, I've fed chickens. My father-in-law raises chickens. It's like reaching your hand down into filling up that hand with feed for all of those chickens, filling it to a brim, and then what? Just scattering it. You, 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 you fill it, you fill it, and then you what? You open your hand, and you give away everything. That's the analogy that David uses in the passage. He's saying that God has his hands full of blessings for you and I, and he's not tight-fisted with them. He doesn't hold on to them. He doesn't fill his pockets with them, but he what? He takes that full hand, and he what? And he opens it, and he sheds his blessings out on each and every one of us, and he gives us not only our needs, but he fulfills what? our desires as well. He gives us so much more than we ever need. And quite frankly, here in the United States, he gives us more than we could ever use. If you're like us, every two or three years, you gotta have a garage sale or what? Sell all the junk that you've accumulated. God, God fulfills our desires from his open hand. Here's what David says today. Give thanks. He's generous. Give thanks. He's generous. Give thanks. Every day, he gives you what you need. Every day, he fulfills desires. Now, aren't you thankful he doesn't fulfill all of our desires? Because if he fulfilled all of our desires, we'd be in trouble because there's things that we desire at times that take us away from him. But God in his sovereignty fulfills our desires. He's extremely generous. Here's the takeaway point today. I've already asked it once. Do your actions. Do your words. Does your life cry out in praise and thanksgiving to God? Are you focused on him? Are you focused on the kingdom? Or is your life all about I'm afraid so many times we're like the person that draws a circle around us and it's about us. We'll be involved in ministry if it's about us. If it's not about us, I'm not gonna be involved in it. I'm gonna help somebody else if I get some benefit out of it. I'm gonna serve if there's a benefit in it for me. And David says, no, it's not about us. It's about the kingdom. God has been extremely generous to us. And our response should be what? To give thanks. With our words, with our actions, with our life, we thank him.